This is a presentation that was delivered remotely on August 16th, 2024, to a seminar on dog and cat population management. The audience was a delegation of the Shanghai Municipal People's Congress. I would like to start with a very quick introduction to the International Companion Animal Management Coalition, or ICAM. We are a coalition of international organisations. You'll see their logos at the top of the slide here. We were formed in 2006. Each organisation works with governments and NGOs of many different countries. We also work with intergovernmental organisations, such as the WHO, FEO, and the World Organisation for Animal Health. Our purpose is to share learning on effective dog and cat population management, which we do through direct consultation, guidance documents, publications, conferences and online articles. I'm the director of the ICAM Coalition and I've been engaged as a technical expert on dog population management by several governments and intergovernmental organisations. This includes the World Organisation for Animal Health, or WOA. I was part of their expert group that wrote the International Standard on Dog Population Management, published in 2022. Earlier this year, I worked with the national government in Bangladesh on the rabies strategy. Mm -hmm. But dog and cat population management usually falls to local government. So I also met with the Dakar city authorities on a new DPM project there. Last month, I was also working in Bangkok, Thailand, with the city administration there, and next month I'll be visiting Cape Town in South Africa. In both these cities, the local government authorities have invested significantly in their dog and cat population management with NGO partners, and my role is to engage and support them to inspire other cities to do the same. Dog and cat population management combines several interventions to comprehensively address different sources of free roaming and unwanted dogs or cats. It includes interventions that promote responsible ownership, such as affordable vet care, identification and registration, and controls of commercial breeding and sale of dogs and cats. You can think of these as upstream actions to prevent animals from becoming stray in the first place. But of course, there are already stray dogs and cats that need to be managed. And this is where trap, neuter, vaccinate and return, TNVR or CNVR or ABC in other countries, plays its role. This is a core intervention that directly mitigates disease risk, but also prevents the current stray animals from breeding and producing future strays. I'm gonna focus on TNVR and how it manages disease risks today. I won't be going into the details of all comprehensive dog population management interventions or services, but if you're interested to learn more, ICAM also hosts free online courses on dog population management, including this course on DPM for policymakers. It's designed to be short in recognition that most policymakers will be working on several subjects and so need something concise and to the point. I want to start with a quick run through the basic epidemiology that underlies our rabies control efforts. The basic reproduction number, or R0, tells us on average how many animals an infected animal can infect, and of course the same for people. How many people one infected person will infect? This assumes we are working with a completely susceptible population. This R0 term used to be only known to epidemiologists, but COVID-19 has seen this come into public discourse. So when R is greater than one, as we see in this animation, the number of infections increase. When R is equal to one, the number of infections remain stable. And when it's less than one, the infection decreases. And we can see that R0 can vary widely with different diseases. Here we have a range of human diseases. We have MERS with an R0 of less than one, explaining why this infection died out. We could also see COVID-19 with an estimate of R0 from early in the pandemic. And we have measles here with a very high R0 indeed, estimated to be between 10 and 15 new infections for every infected person. And here we have two animal diseases, rinderpest and FMD with an R0 of five and 10 respectively. 
Rinder pest has now been globally eradicated and FMD has been eliminated from several countries and is targeted for global eradication by 2030. For both these diseases, vaccination of animals plays a core role. And finally, we have the Arnauta rabies. On average, a rabid dog will spread the virus to one or two other dogs. A reassuringly low Arnaut for which we are all eternally grateful and explains why rabies control is so achievable using vaccination of dogs. So what leads to these different values of R0? Well, R0 is influenced by three factors. One is its transmissibility. If there is a contact between two animals, will the disease be transmitted? Next, we have the contact rate, which is how many contacts happen over time. And then how long you're infected for, the duration of infection, and in particular, the duration of infectiveness. Now, if you can decrease any of these, then you start to reduce R, the effective reproduction number. And now we are talking about R and not R naught. R is the expected number of infections in a population that is undergoing intervention. It's no longer naive and totally susceptible. And the closer we can get R to zero, the faster we can eliminate the disease. Now, I'm talking about rabies in dogs here. We know that rabies in people and cats are spillover events. They do not form part of the reservoir for the rabies virus. So the most efficient method of elimination is to focus on eliminating the virus from the dog population using vaccination to create herd immunity. History has taught us that culling does not work. It has no effect on transmissibility. It doesn't change the duration of infection, unless you are lucky enough to cull a dog that actually has rabies, which is actually unlikely when you consider how low the incidence rate is. For example, the US CDC estimated that only 1% of reported dog bites are actually from rabid dogs. It's also difficult to spot rabies in the early stages of the disease, so the vast majority of dogs culled will actually be healthy. And it either has no impact on contact rates or very transient. The mechanism for this failure to impact contact rates is interesting. Dogs are social species. Even if you manage to cull half the dogs in a population, which really does take some effort, they will travel that extra distance to interact. And immediately following culls, the perturbation of the social structure may actually lead to an increase in contact rates. The behaviour of a dog with rabies symptoms is also relevant. Some will be moving, capable of moving quite some distance before the disease takes over and they die. And then we also have a remarkable ability for the dog population to replenish its numbers after culls, which I'll come back to again in a moment. And together this leads to the finding that rabies is independent of dog density. It persists with a fairly consistent R0 across a wide range of free roaming dog density. We also see that culling is counterproductive. When used following a vaccination campaign of free roaming dogs, it's often the dogs that were catchable for vaccination that are also catchable for culling. When culls are used in the same location as TNVR programs, this causes disruption to the benefits invested in by the TNVR organisation. This may happen where culling is unregulated, and so individuals or property management companies may poison or trap strays that have already been sterilised and vaccinated, which is, of course, a terrible waste of resources and counterproductive to disease control. And where own dogs are caught up in culls, we find people will move their dogs to avoid culling teams, I have a couple of examples to share from Indonesia where rabies outbreaks were worsened by culling. And owners are likely to disengage with rabies control activities when they find that they include culling, running the risk of reducing vaccination coverage of owned animals. There is also a huge potential for causing significant distress to the public, leading to complaints and in some countries erupting into public protests, as we have seen recently in both Morocco and Turkey. And later in the seminar, Dr. Ladney talked about this with specific reference to children. 
I wanted to share two examples of failures to control rabies using culling in Indonesia. I've chosen two from Indonesia because it shows that the lesson of the ineffectiveness of culling is a difficult one to learn, although we can celebrate that the Indonesian government has now enshrined vaccination for rabies control in their policies. So first we have Flores. There was an outbreak of rabies in dogs in 1997. The local government responded by culling 70% of the dogs in the outbreak district of East Flores. Many citizens were forced to take part in the culls themselves, but unsurprisingly, the bond between people and dogs led to some citizens to move their dogs, dogs to other districts and rabies were seeded across the island. The geographical scope of the culling campaign was expanded to the newly infected districts, but rabies was not controlled and it became endemic. Then in 2008, an outbreak occurred on the previously rabies-free island of Bali. The government attempted a combination of vaccination and culling, but the locally produced vaccine that they selected to use was very ineffective and people again were upset by the culls and moved their dogs to safer areas, again effectively seeding rabies across the whole island. I've spoken a lot about dogs so far because I'm focusing on rabies control and this requires dog vaccination for virus elimination. But culling faces the same issues of ineffectiveness when used with cats. This is one example of a study in New Caledonia. They attempted a mass cull of cats on a particular peninsula and they achieved the culling of 44% of the cat population in a relatively short space of time. But within just three months, the cat numbers were back up to pre-culling levels. The ability of dog and cat populations to rebound from culls can come as a surprise, but there are several mechanisms behind this ability, mostly linked to the fact that when animals are culled, they leave behind space in the habitat and the, in and the increase in available resources can be capitalised upon by the remaining animals. So the dogs or cats that escape culls, and there are always some, no matter how hard you try, these remaining animals are able to breed more successfully. And along with that breeding comes increased contact rates and hence a higher risk of rabies and other diseases being transmitted between breeding animals. Animals from other areas are able to immigrate into vacated niches. This particularly happens with young animals that are looking for a new place to set up territory. And that immigration also increases contact rates. So again, a higher risk of disease transmission. And then we have the ongoing source of owned animals. They can be a really significant source of future stray animals through loss or purposeful abandonment of owned animals. The problem with culling these animals is too late. You're working downstream of the real problem, dealing only with the symptom of poor ownership. Working upstream or on the cause means promoting and supporting responsible ownership. And that means ascribing a value to dogs and cats so they are treated with more care. And culling doesn't do that. It devalues the individual animal. Conversely, we know that vaccination is effective, reducing transmissibility and duration of infection. In fact, bringing the time of infectiveness down to zero because the dog's immune system kills the rabies virus without the virus ever having the opportunity to infect another animal or person. And that's thanks to the very effective vaccines that we have for rabies today. Vaccination is basically the recruitment of dogs in soldiers in our war against the rabies virus. And vaccination enjoys widespread community support, so we are guaranteed citizen satisfaction. But better still is when we combine vaccination and sterilisation either in the form of TNBR when we're working with free roaming animals or making sterilization more accessible for owned animals. The principal mechanism by which sterilization helps is by reducing turnover. So in this graph, we see the proportion of vaccinated dogs rocket up during an annual vaccination campaign and then reduce over the coming months as vaccinated dogs die and susceptible puppies are born before being boosted back up by the next annual vaccination campaign. 
In effect, what we can do with vaccination is to make this fall in vaccination coverage more shallow, ensuring it doesn't fall below critical herd immunity, making our vaccination campaigns more effective. I also wanted to show you this line. Now, this is what can be achieved for a free roaming dog population, not with annual mass vaccination, but with all year round TNVR. You can bring the proportion of vaccinated dogs, uh, vaccinated and sterilized dogs up over a period of time. And if you keep maintaining your TNVR fur, you can keep the population at this level well above critical herd immunity. I would like to share just a couple of examples of successful TMVR. The first is this example from Bangkok in Thailand. This is the area of Greater Bangkok, home to 15 million people. And the NGO Soy Dog uh, Foundation, supported by Dogs Trust Worldwide and the local government, work together on dog population management in this Greater Bangkok area. Over the last seven years, they have completed half a million sterilizations and vaccinations of free roaming dogs. Those are both owned and unowned free roaming dogs. This has resulted in 54% reduction in the density of stray dogs over seven years and a reduction in complaints about nuisance caused by dogs. Through a questionnaire survey of uh, Bangkok citizens, they found fewer dog bites reported by people living in areas where TMVR had been run for the longest time. The citizens in those areas enjoying several years of TMVR reported high levels of comfort and even happiness about the stray dogs in their area because they were safe, vaccinated and not breeding. They also saw a reduction in dog rabies cases, but as I talked about earlier, this was not due to there being fewer dogs, but because vaccination levels were kept so high through the TMVR efforts. This second example is from Jaipur in India, where a TMVR programme they call it ABC for animal birth control, has been running for nearly 30 years. It's a smaller city than Bangkok, so the number of TNVR operations is lower. But they've also been running this program for such a long time that they have kept the dog population from expanding in size and density, despite the fact that this city grows at a rate of about 50% every 10 years. In the first 10 years of their TNVR work, they were able to reduce the human rabies cases to zero in the TMVR areas of the city, whilst the number of deaths in the non-TMVR areas of the city increased. Their street counts have also shown a reduction in free roaming dog density, as you can see in the graph here. The dog population counts have declined consistently over time. They've also seen a reduction in the number of reported dog bites to the hospital and have worked out from the seasonality in these reported bites. This is actually mostly due to a reduction in breeding and the maternal defensive behaviour that some dogs show when they perceive their puppies are under threat. And I wanted to contrast this with a publication that looked at dog bites in Dhaka, Bangladesh, during a period of culling a very high number of dogs in the city. 22,000 on average per year. This is probably around half of the total free roaming dog population being culled every year, which took a lot of effort and a lot of resources. Despite this large amount of culling, there was no difference at all in the number of dog bites reported to the main hospital each year. And the dogs simply kept replenishing their numbers. The data from the TNVR work in Jaipur has been collated and used to run a cost benefit analysis of their work over a 23 year period. This estimated the TNVR work had averted over 360,000 dog bites, leading to a saving of nearly $6 million for the health services. This also estimated that nearly 500 human rabies deaths have been averted, saving over $38 million coming not just from savings in treatment, but in DALIs or the economic implications of an early death from rabies. In summary, they estimated that for every dollar spent on TMVR, $8.5 was saved in bite treatment and $58 in total societal costs from both rabies deaths and bites, which is an excellent return on the TMVR investment. 
I wanted to emphasise that the most effective TNVR happens with community engagement, so working with the public to find volunteers that will support TNVR efforts, and there's often many of these people available. This can bring costs down because volunteers donate their time, and this can really help to tackle conflict between citizens, bringing greater harmony to communities. I hear that such benefits have already been achieved by the pilot team VR work already happening in Shanghai, led by local NGOs. And just as an example, Singapore in particular has had success with working with dog and cat feeders. Some authorities attempt to ban cat or dog feeding. These bans fail, as the feeders are strongly motivated to feed these animals and will defend their actions, fueling yet more community conflict. However, the authorities in Singapore have taken the approach to define and demand that feeding is done responsibly. They work with animal welfare groups to establish responsible feeding expectations and pair these with funded dog and cat sterilisation programmes. The final subject that I want to briefly mention is the risk posed by the dog and cat meat trade to effective rabies control. There are risks for the people involved in the capture, movement and slaughter of dogs and cats for meat. These are just two examples of reported human rabies deaths linked to the dog meat trade in Vietnam. In a 2007 outbreak, 30% of human cases were linked to dog slaughter. And again, in a very recent outbreak in 2022, they found human deaths from rabies transmitted during dog slaughter for meat. But perhaps more concerning for those of us trying to establish an effective and sustained herd immunity is the movement of dogs and cats with unknown vaccination and disease status, both within country and within city, but also transboundary between country. I've included maps from just two countries here, Vietnam and Cambodia, from this report by the International NGO Four Paws. While it's impossible to quantify the exact number of animals involved due to the unregulated nature of the trade, it is of significant magnitude. Estimates for Cambodia, Indonesia and Vietnam combined are 10 million dogs and cats killed for the trade every year. Many of these will have been owned, some possibly vaccinated and not all taken with owner's consent. And if we think back to what we want to achieve for rabies control, the meat trade obviously increases population turnover and hence works in opposition to our attempts to establish herd immunity and brings with it the risk of incursions. I understand that these risks are also apparent in the dog and cat meat trade within Shanghai and I will refer to local NGO experts for this subject. My purpose in mentioning this trade is to highlight that this is an issue across the region and the inherent rabies risk is one reason why this trade is subject to an increasing number of bans, including the recent decision in South Korea to ban dog meat with a three year phase out period. So in summary, culling does not control rabies. It can in fact increase the risk of transmission. Vaccination is a highly effective solution to rabies control. It can be made more powerful when combined with sterilization. TNVR is the best method of managing free roaming dogs and cats, leading to stable and healthy populations. Citizens welcome TNVR and the harmony that it can bring to a community, especially one that has been struggling with conflict over dogs or cats and what to do about them. Comprehensive dog and cat population management, which combines other interventions with TNVR, are the best way to achieve sustained benefits and the dog and cat meat trade is a very real threat to disease control success. My thanks for your attention and time.